Hey, this is Dr. Ben White's host of the Rational Wellness Podcast. I talk to the leading health and nutrition experts and researchers in the field to bring you the latest in cutting edge health information. Subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast for weekly updates. And to learn more, check out my website, drwhites.com. Thanks for joining me and let's jump into the podcast. Hello, Rational Wellness Podcasters. Today, we'll be having a discussion with integrative neurologist, Dr. Ilya Dubovoy. He's a board-certified neurologist and trained medical acupuncturist. He received his MD degree from Tulane University School of Medicine, and he also did a residency in neurology. His current practice is focused on integrative and functional medicine, nutrition, and applied biology. Dr. Dubovoy chose neurology because working with the nervous system allows him to treat his patients holistically. In his practice, he follows the advice of Asclepius, is is that pronounced properly? Uh, One of the Greeks, I'm assuming. First the word, then the herb, lastly the knife. This approach enables him to build upon the basics of disease prevention and health maintenance with his patients from a top-down, systemic, and psycho-spiritual, and bottom-up, biochemical, and energetic approach to the human being. Dr. Dubravoy, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So, you know, I noticed on your background, uh, on your website, that you have a background in philosophy. And I also have a background in philosophy. I received my BA in philosophy from UCLA before deciding to become a chiropractor. Oh, wow. That's, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I I didn't uh, study it formally. I mean, I took a few classes in college, but it was always a personal interest of mine. Yeah, I saw you had a lecture about Derrida and 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 something else on your website. Yeah, there are a few things I've talked to people about. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So um tell us about uh what types of neurological conditions you tend to treat in your practice. Well, broadly speaking, um neurologists treat a range of diagnoses and complaints. Uh, everything from neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, epilepsy, and, you know, other things like epilepsy, certain kinds of neuropathic pain conditions, migraines and headaches of various kinds. That's sort of the conventional uh, neurologist's bread and butter. Okay. I do see some of that. Um, But when patients are often looking for a functional or integrative neurologist, they're going to come in with less defined diagnostic complaints. Usually fatigue, as we all know, is a very common medical symptom. Right. And yet there's really no, um, you know, there are di- vague diagnostic categories like chronic fatigue syndrome or right. fibromyalgia, which they've attempted to standardize diagnostic criteria for, but in reality, are not particularly useful as diagnostic categories. Right. Non-specific. So if you see a patient with fatigue, what's what, what are some of the things that you'll do? What are some of the things you're thinking about? What kinds of questions are you asking them? How, how, do, you, what, what, how do you work them up? Sure. So fatigue is a very common complaint. And whenever we encounter it, we ask, what's sort of the the other patterns? What is the context of this fatigue? Are they fine, but they have a low exercise tolerance? That's one issue. Are they tired because they're not sleeping well? You know, that's another issue. Are they, do they have a diurnal pattern of activity? Meaning they wake up wired in the early morning and then by the afternoon they're exhausted and then they have another bout of energy maybe in the evening. Um, These are all patterns which can suggest different causes. But fundamentally, fatigue is a matter of a low energy state, top to bottom. So it can be low energy from motivation and drive, so a component of situational depression, all the way down to the mitochondria aren't working well. And there's many things that can affect the mitochondria. 
bottom line, most of the time when we talk about, you know, biomolecular questions, it's too much of one, too much of something bad or not enough of something good. <laughs> right. And that is like one of the fundamental principles of functional medicine, right? I think one of the, you know, founding fathers of functional medicine basically described it like that. Basically, what do you not have enough of? And let's give it to the patient. Let's find out what you have too much of and let's remove some of that. Exactly. Uh, a lot of fine tuning. But some things are very obvious and really are quite mainstream. I mean, people test for things like iron, right? Or routinely. And yet, right. yet the frequency of iron deficiency <laughs> is uh, ridiculously uh, high. Um, I'm not even talking about something like B12 or, you know, even folate, which we all know doctors should check for. And yet, I mean, uh, our, you know, the rates of deficiency, even in young patients are, you know, astronomical. Yeah. I think for some of those things, it depends on how you test for it too. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a factor with a lot of, um, uh, certain nutrients. Yeah. The ma magnesium uh, in particular is a popular example, right? The difference between intracellular and extracellular. Uh, yeah. I think the same thing with these other nutrients like B12, you know, I, I don't find, uh, I find that typically if B12 is suspected at all, they might run a serum B12. And I, I have had quite a number of patients where the serum, serum B12 was normal, but they obviously had B12 issues. They either had. Right. And this goes to some of the lab, you know, particulars of lab cutoffs and whatnot. So the standard that you see on most, um, most of the basic labs that I've seen are is below 200 or something like that. Uh, I forget what it is, uh, maybe nanograms or micrograms uh, per deciliter. I forget what the actual, what the units are. But in reality, really anything below 400 could be considered significant uh, deficiency. And that's actually a standard they use in other countries. So, for example, in Japan, standard lab cutoff for B12 is 400. Right. And if you take that, you're going to have a much more sensitive um, test. And patients often have symptoms in that range, in, in my experience as well. So just because the lab officially is normal and they're dismissed, I uh, I will replete these patients and symptoms will improve. Right. And then there's also more functional labs, like looking at things like homocysteine and methylmalonic acid. Yeah. <laughs> we call and, those, yeah, we call those functional labs. But and, in reality, and, that's all, uh, you know, convention that should be all part of conventional medical workup. Right. Um, yeah, homocysteine in particular is very useful because if you aren't doing the genetic tests for something like methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase um, um, uh, mutations, you can sort of get a rough estimate or a rough guess of methylation efficiency just by comparing the overall serum folate, which again is is not you know it's a test that looks at the blood levels, but the liver stores a lot of it exactly like B12, um, you can sort of get an idea of comparing the folate levels with the homocysteine levels. So if the folate's high, but homocysteine is also high, you can, you can be, you know, rather confident that there's some sort of methylation problem in the pathway, uh, despite the uh, abundance of folate. And then you have to think, you know, did this patient need methylfolate? Do they need um, bet, um, you know, uh, what is, uh, do they need other methylation, uh, and, you know, uh, cofactors? Right. So there's quite Methyl a lot of methylated B6, methylated folate, methylated B12, um, riboflavin, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, the B vitamins in general cover quite a lot of ground. Right. Um, patients with all kinds of metabolic deficits, which could be mild, may not show up until later in life, uh, can be kind of covered up with a, with sufficient B vitamins. So let's, let's look at your whole analysis. You have this patient with fatigue, you're going to look at iron. So I'm assuming. Well, broadly, a micronutrient workup, let's say that. So we look yeah. at micronutrients. We look at, um, 
other lifestyle habits. So will you do a full micronutrient analysis? In in some cases, yeah. Uh, I like, I mean, there's a myriad of these tests and labs that offer it. Depending on the insurance and the situation, right? we'll go with, um, I, I, you know, I'm not one to jump on a lot of these functional medicine tests, mainly because uh, I see patients from sort of a wide range of uh, means, and it's not always in their budget. So right. I'll often treat empirically in some okay. cases. And in other cases, we'll work with sort of standard lab core or quest right. insurance covered labs. Okay. To the best that we can. But yeah, micronutrient analysis is a great place to start with something like fatigue. And then I, I like to think about the human organism in sort of a feminal, phenomenological way. So what is it that we what is it that we do on a day-to-day basis? What, what, what would it be like if we were looking at the human being from some sort of like alien biologist, a disembodied alien biologist perspective? Okay. And you look at the human being and the one thing that would kill us pretty quickly if we don't have it is air exchange, right? So breathing. Right. But breathing encompasses a whole lot of other things besides, you know, the actual physical act, right? I mean, there's the utilization of oxygen in the peripheral tissues. There's the um, function of the vagal nerve and the stimulation of the viscera by the diaphragm, which, uh, you know, is a kind of, um, has a lot to do with our mode of being, our psychological and mental state. So breathing encompasses quite a lot of quite a lot of aspects of the human being. And if you look at Eastern spiritual practices, you know, prana, chi, you know, the breath is really the foundation of, of our energetic state. So that's kind of the number one thing, because if we don't breathe, we can't really live. And so if the patient is anxious, tighten the chest, if they're having digestive issues related to um, basically insufficient um, uh, movement or flow of energy in the in the lower viscera and the pelvis, if there's trauma, uh, that can be a, a major factor. That's not often, that's usually not the first thing that I work on, but if you want to think about the the way I think about it, it is something that I usually get into uh, early, um, but usually work on later. So, that's so when your patients have difficulty breathing properly, are there certain go-to breathing exercises you'll utilize? Yeah, so the biggest thing is very simple uh, what they sometimes call square breathing, you know, abdominal breathing, uh, inhale for four seconds, hold for four seconds, exhale for four seconds, hold the exhale for four seconds. Okay. Um, and you can increase those numbers as you go. Uh, but that's a good place to start. Okay. Uh, it depends on the actual aspect. You know, a lot of people have trouble just breathing from their through their nose. Right. And that itself can be quite therapeutic if uh, practiced sufficiently, you know, helps with nasal congestion, helps with um, asthma, uh, because not only because of the physical um, warming and conditioning of the air through the turbinates, but also because of secretion of nitrous oxide. Uh, there's quite a few, quite a few physiologic benefits to proper breathing. And I know some practitioners will recommend mouth taping while sleeping to encourage nose breathing. Yeah, yeah, there's mouth taping. There's um, there's sort of a, uh, what do they call it, mewing, right? The exercise with the tongue, jaw placement. There's a few other um, devices uh, that are are useful as sort of a first line for, um, for a number of bad habits besides just sleep apnea, which is common tricky to deal with, uh, at least without going the full mechanical route. Of so, so when you have a patient with sleep apnea and and they don't want to use a CPAP machine, how do you deal with that? Well, uh, to be honest, the best thing that I've found 
or it's not a really a short-term fix, but uh, is dealing with the very often underlying metabolic syndrome. So okay. uh, if there's a lot of inflammation in the in the soft tissues, you can get uh, basically congestion, and that causes a lot of the issues with apnea. And it's not just about being, you know, not, not just being large. It really is about the kind of edema that can form uh, when you're especially in a recumbent position. So helping with lymphatic drainage, helping with um, uh, generally inflammatory states, so just helping inflammation in general, can actually improve that quite a bit. So how do, you, how do you help with lymphatic drainage? So there's a few specific products that I like that, are, um, that help with fat-soluble toxins. Um, there's improved bioflow and um, things like uh, grapeseed extract, asparagine methyl chalcone, a lot of bioflavonoids can be helpful. Um, a product by Thorne that I really like called Liver Cleanse. It used to be called Lipotrypin because it, okay. was, because it was specifically a uh, product for um, for lymphatic flow. Okay. Uh, they remarketed, they rebranded it for as Liver Cleanse because it is stimulate bile flow. Um, I I don't think I'm familiar with that. What are the main ingredients in there? Uh, it's got. Um, it's got some milk thistle, uh, I think burdock, berberine, and um, chicory. Oh, okay. So it's a blend of sort of traditional, you could think of it as liver detox herbs. And it works quite well. Um, it's also an effective migraine preventative. I uh, use it for a number of things. But it, it, the, what it's, I think of it as a category of detoxifiers, specifically okay. for liquid soluble um, products. So, um, xenoestrogens, excess estrogens, um, uh, rancid fats, um, any kind of fat soluble toxins are very, very well, uh, dealt with by this product. Right. I know a lot of people will use, um, they'll use herbal bitters to stimulate bile flow. I know there's a product called Tutka that people use. Yeah, um, yeah. Any, any of the bile acids. So really a lot, there's a kind of a category of things that you can do in this situation. Tutka, um, col, even cholecystyramine is used in functional medicine. Right. I don't, but it's kind of a... It's yeah. Especially for like mold toxicity and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and uh, so this, this covers quite a broad range. But yeah, yeah there is a sort of broad category of bile acid. Uh, right. Yeah, Which, there's a lot of ways. More than one way is to skin a cat. You know, we, all have, <laughs> we all have our preferred. So, do you, do you test for toxins? You know, uh, I do sometimes. Often patients, you know, more often than not, patients come in with some. In my experience, at least, I've had a lot of patients come in with uh, more testing than I would have done. <laughs> um, but it's difficult to. You know, it's not just about the degree of, um, how do I put it? You can have patients with quite a lot of burden of toxicity who may not have necessarily the same symptoms. And you have patients who may have pretty mild exposure, but clearly have a, a, a bad reaction. Sure. So it, it's difficult to, um, I feel like the clinical presentation is often as useful as any kind of uh, any of the advanced testing, sure. Because you can end up, you know, going down a rabbit hole on some uh, on some labs, and uh, it's it's difficult to uh, get back to the uh, to the clinical symptoms. So, and, if you suspect somebody of having certain kind of toxins, like heavy metals or uh, environmental toxins um, besides bioflow, are there other strategies you you'll utilize? Right. So there's more general stuff like intestinal binders. Okay. Um, you what's know, your famous? What, what's your favorite uh, binder or binders that you like to use? Well, I I sometimes use charcoal. Okay. Um, I will use. Um, um, what is it? 
ultra binder uh, from Quicksilver or? Uh, I use a product by uh, Designs for Health, the um, GI Revive. It has a few it has a few things in it that are effective for leaky gut if it's really right. bad. Yeah. Uh, I like that one. Um, okay. There's a, I mean, there's a bunch of stuff that, that sure. people like. Yeah. And then a lot of people use uh, glutathione, especially like liposomal oh. glutathione. Yeah, yeah. And the funny thing is with that, you know, uh, we, uh, there are people who really do have trouble um, manufacturing it from just getting enough N-acetylcysteine. So if there's right. a really bad toxic burden, I I have found that people who have trouble with NAC can actually do really well with the liposomal glutathione, which is something that I, um, I guess, was a bit unexpected in practice, you know, because theoretically, you know, why bother with it? And at least from, you know, the, the uh, what I knew before, but there are definitely people who... So I, I think for people who are not aware, what you're saying is, is um, uh, glutathione is one of the major detoxifying agents in the liver. Um, and if you take supplements of N-acetylcysteine that stimulate your body's own natural production of glutathione. But um, a percentage of patients are not able to actually turn the N-acetylcysteine into glutathione. So in those cases, taking glutathione, especially liposomally, where it might be better absorbed, is a better strategy. Yes, yes. And it could be also genetic. There are. Um... And there are some factors there. Yeah. Yeah. I use the liposomal glutathione. There's also a, 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 an acetyl glutathione, acetylic glutathione, which you can use. Right. As, I think designs for, I, I've used the designs for health one. Okay. I like that brand for a lot of things, but I, I'm not married to any particular, um, you know, I don't, I basically, uh, I, I don't sell a lot of my own supplements. I just use a kind of a, uh, what is it? Uh, one of these uh, accounts like Emerson of full scripts. Right. So I, don't, I don't have a big inventory. Okay. Uh, but yeah, I, I use a wide range of things. So when it comes to neurological health, what is some of the most important nutritional factors? Well, neurological, the brain is uh, got quite a lot of lipids. Right. So, uh, cholesterol as well. And I, I know you mentioned uh, seizures, and it's pretty common uh, for seizures to use a high-fat, low-carb, ketogenic-type diet. Yes, uh, there's good research on the ketogenic diet and seizures. It's difficult to, uh, you know, especially in kids, it's a little bit difficult to maintain. But uh, what they do now is if you supplement with medium chain triglycerides or even um, isolated ones like uh, butyrate and things like that directly, you can right. get away with a higher protein and, and even a small amount of carbs in the diet. So it's right. much more, it's much easier than it, than it used to be with some of these medical foods that are available. So that, that is a, that is an effective strategy. It's also been studied in certain cancers, including uh, brain tumors. And yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I've had Dr. Thomas Seafried on the podcast and um, mm -hmm. Nisha Winters, and they both um, used the metabolic approach to cancer in a lot of patients. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it seems promising. I've um, I've also recommended quite a lot of fish oil for a lot of neuropsychiatric complaints. Right. And uh, Dr. Dale Bredesen is using a, a version of the ketogenic diet, the keto flex diet for patients with Alzheimer's. Yes, it is a uh, well researched, right? The whole um, type three diabetes hypothesis yep. comes out, came out of Brown. I think there's a lot to that. Um, definitely the metabolic approach to Alzheimer's, I found to be helpful. Any clinical pearls for dealing with patients with Alzheimer's? It's uh, very multifactorial. Um, yep. You got to approach it through all the, um, what's the name, the, that regimen that um, Dr. Uh, oh, what's his name? Bredesen. 
Yeah, the medicine protocol. Yeah, yeah that that approach is is very useful. Yes, uh, absolutely. It has the most um, has excellent data. Yeah, it's difficult because it's very comprehensive, and I find the biggest challenge is that older patients, especially ones who have more severe disease, um, get into a state where it's very difficult to make the sufficient you know lifestyle changes. Right. And that's the biggest factor. Uh, but I have seen quite impressive uh, results in, young, in patients who have milder or younger, who are younger or have milder symptoms. And I wouldn't hesitate to, um, to recommend that for anyone who's anyone out there. And now Dr. He- Heather Sanderson is setting up um, Alzheimer's um, uh, nursing homes using the Bredesen approach for inpatient care. Oh, wow. Well, that, yeah, it would make a lot of sense when you have the controlled environment. Right. And I think that'll be, yeah, it's pretty impressive. Certainly uh, beats the barking up the tree of these, um, uh, you know, uh, amyloid antibodies that they've been trying. Oh, to- yeah. So yeah. I mean- you're referring to the fact that the predominant theory for dealing with Alzheimer's for the last number of decades is the idea that Alzheimer's is caused by this buildup of amyloid plaque, and we need to use some medication, like some antibody that's going to block the amyloid plaque. And they keep announcing some new drug that's been approved that costs tens of thousands of dollars. And and then when the results come out, it turns out that Actually, nobody gets better. Uh, some of the patients get better at a slower rate, but then they have all these horrible side effects, like bleeding in their brain, and and oh, yeah, yeah, it's it's, yeah. it's it's dismal, really. And and the only reason I can, I don't know, the only thing I can think of why they're pushing it is, I guess they have to justify the decades of expenditures on these um, on this theory, which really we knew a while ago is isn't. Um, isn't isn't very good at explaining uh, what goes on. Oh, no, absolutely. There's actually a big scandal. In fact, I had Dr. Bredesen on the podcast and we oh. discussed it, uh, I think, a year or two ago. There was this big scandal that the uh, some of the uh, hallmark research that was used to justify the um, amyloid plaque theory of Alzheimer's was the images were actually falsified wow. uh, by one of the researchers. It's like one of the biggest scandals in medical research <laughs> ever. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you know, there's all these things. I mean, they've been <laughs> it's like beta blockers, anesthesia and all this other stuff. You, you start digging in and a lot of the the treatment paradigms they just they just don't make sense because you can you can or they have very little explanatory power uh it's 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 hard to find a silver bullet so everyone is really desperate because that's the basis of pharmacotherapy right we're going to have one pathway and one drug that's just going to completely cure the condition right antibiotic you know we have antibiotic envy right (laughs) we uh we're hoping I still remember in medical school, I remember reading about the, um, uh, what are those, that, that class of, uh, of anti-diabetic drugs that basically take a hammer to the, to the kidneys and just cause glycosuria. Right. So I, was, I was like, and this was back when they were still, um, they weren't, there weren't any approved. And I was like, this is ridiculous. This will never go through. It's going to cause all kinds of problems, urinary tract infections, blah, blah. And now these are very popular drugs. They're prescribed for heart, just patients with heart failure and hardly any, you know, any real diabetes. I mean, they're, they're crazy popular and they have all kinds of complications. And, and uh, it just, it's another feature of this kind of pharmacologic approach where, again, you're, you're taking a hammer to a healthy part of the system in order to compensate for, you know, some problem somewhere else. Right. So, and that's that's why you find more of a functional medicine approach, a, a better way of dealing with these complex uh, degenerative uh, conditions. Well, yeah, better if you you know if you if you like your patients, if you if you want to be <laughs> if you want to be, I think if you want to practice good medicine, yeah, I think that's the only way because you know the first rule is do no harm. 
and uh, you can't, you know, you have to make sure that the benefits outweigh the risks, and you have to make sure that the that the options that you're using are the safest. And sometimes that means starting with something that's, you know, may not be as, you know, if, you know, effective. You know, if you if you if you're gonna give steroids for everything, yeah, patients are are gonna feel a little better. That's for sure. So um, hey, doc. Why why don't you give us a couple of uh, examples, maybe clinical pearls of of a few patients you've been working with that you've gotten really good results with, oh, and, sure. and what what are some of the things that you did for them? Uh, sure. Well, I have uh, one case very interesting of um, a gentleman who came in with a bad neuropathy. I okay. did a workup, sort of a very conventional medical workup. What were um, the neuro- neurological symptoms? Uh, he had a he had he had severe neuropathy, uh, mostly sensory, and it okay. Was this was it like in the hands and feet. Yeah, hands and feet. It was it would act up with activity. Um, it would climb. He would. It was incre- It was going up his legs. There was a significant degree of numbness, not a lot of pain, and um, so it's it's a wide differential. There's a lot of autoimmune and. Uh, potentially generative and nutritional conditions which can cause this. So this is a conventional workup in most for most neurologists. So we looked at things like um, immunofixation and serum electrophoresis. We looked at various antibodies. We looked at various nutritional testing. And lo and behold, he had, he had a, um, a pattern that was suspicious for um, a plasma cell dis- uh, plasma cell dyscrasia. So this is a rare but uh, and very protean condition. It can cause all kinds of strange symptoms, purely cardiac, purely neuropathy. But these plasma cell dyscrasias, you know, we think of something like multiple myeloma. It's sort of in the same right. category of conditions. Um, and this is a sort of a hemonc diagnosis. And normally you'd refer them to a specialist there. But he his condition was um, it was borderline. Like he had the neuropathy, but he really did not have any of the other concerning features of the condition. And, and we looked. We got an echocardiogram. We got I got a very thorough workup on him because I didn't want to hand him off to anyone um, that I you know would just maybe most likely not really actually do anything, right? <laughs> or worst case, over treat. Um, I told him though that realistically, you know, with his symptoms, it would be reasonable to go ahead and get a um, a uh, marrow blood uh, bone marrow biopsy and really, you know, pursue a hemonc approach. And I'd refer him out. But this guy, he was he was a successful your executive, retired executive, um, German guy actually. Uh, and he he was like, no, I'm old. I lived my life. You know, you treat. I don't want any invasive procedures. And I don't want any potential chemotherapy. And if if they say they're not going to do anything, then I'd rather you do something. So I was like, okay, you know, I, I wanted an informed consent, basically. Right. So how and did so you I treat started, him? Yeah, and so I treated him with um, a range of supplements, um, sort of detoxifiers, NAC. But I think what really helped uh, in the end was uh, curcumin. And uh, there's actually a lot of conventional literature on how curcumin is as effective as, you know, chemotherapy dose steroids for, um, for, for multiple myeloma and other plasma cell dyscrasias. Right. Cool. So how much and what type of curcumin? So uh, there's a range of fairly effective liposomal curcumins. Um, I actually use uh mariva it's sold under a right. bunch of yes things. yeah i'm familiar um, with that form it's pretty inexpensive is the reason i like it and it's has reasonable it's not the best in terms of absorption but it's it's good yeah i also use something called Turiva, which is more of it's not really actually a formulated with liposomal absorption it's got a lot of it's more of a natural extract and i use it sort of for other things but uh, him i think i started on the on the mariva and his his labs normalized, so he had like a uh, a um, monoclonal protein spike that disappeared within a right. few months. Cool. 
So how uh, much? What was the dosage of the Mariva? I think it was one tablet just three times a day with meals. And That's we, it. That's pretty low dosage. Was okay, like two hundred fifty milligrams, five hundred or something. Yeah, it's a. Uh, I think maybe it was two capsules. I think if I, it comes in two fifties or five hundreds. Yeah, know. it's usually two fifty a capsule, and he usually recommend at least. Two I think capsules. we did two then. I think we did five hundred yeah. then. Okay. Five hundred three times a day with meals. Okay. And yeah, he is the uh, his labs normalized. The the spike broke the you know the uh, monoclonal. Great. And his That's cool. has improved significantly, even before the lab is normalized. Yeah, I mean, curcumin is an amazing herb. It really is. I mean, its effect on various mechanisms related to cancer, even though, you know, it's not, it's not a chemotherapy agent, it's not going to be as strong as any of those conventional medications. It, the fact that it does affect so many different pathways that affect cancer. It's pretty amazing herb. Yeah, uh, but the data is very good. I mean, it, again. Cool. It, you want to give us one more example? Sure. Um, I'm a big fan of nutritional lithium. Okay. Well. I use it a lot for patients. And I mean, there's really, I, there's a Dr. Um, what's his name? Green, uh, right? Uh, who Green, Bla Green, Green Black. Black. Yeah. Green Black. Yeah, yeah, I think. I made a mistake. He wrote the book on it. You know, he's a big, um, big guy in the functional psychiatry uh, literature. And you know, it, you read these um, uh, these monographs about these great single remedies, and you're like, okay, well, we'll try it out. But yeah, in reality, it, it yeah, really quite well. I have a number of patients who have you know th these types, like people with with anxiety, irritability these very specific kind of symptoms and right. nothing seems to work. Uh, I've had a number of patients respond beautifully to very low doses. And, um, you know, I. So typically I what's the dosage you're using? Placebo. Hmm? What's the dosage you're using? Well, uh, it varies from, I start off low. I like, um, I have a patient who really open up like the five milligram pills and take a little bit from that. I have one. Oh, very okay patients with a bunch of issues, you know, she be diagnosed with POTS, mast cell activation, blah, blah. She's very sensitive to all these meds. Very little that we, that she can tolerate. But the lithium, if she took the full pill, it was just too much. You get dizzy, lightheaded. But a little bit worked extremely well for mood uh, and helped a lot with uh, the psychiatric symptoms. So I'm a big fan of the nutritional lithium. I have a few patients who've had it, and even and in safe in kids too. I mean the yeah, the, um, the effect is quite dramatic. Absolutely, yeah. We had Dr. Peter Bongiorno on the podcast, and he wrote a monogram about li low dose lithium as well. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, you know, it's it's quite amazing the the research and the data. And there are actually conventional, you know, academic psychiatrists who are here, at, you know, in Richmond at VCU, I know who, who use it and even have lectured about it. So it's uh, encouraging. That's great. So um, I think we're going to wrap up uh, pretty soon here. Um, any sorts of final thoughts you want to leave us with? Things yes, you want to talk about? Yeah, I wanted to finish this discussion about this sort of phenomenological approach. Okay. So talk about breathing, right? And then we think about what else can't we live without as human beings? Well, actually, the next one is, is um, you can talk about water, of course, proper right. hydration. And there's a lot of interesting things about water, about the structure of water, about pH balance, about whether, um, you know, uh, about some of the unusual physical properties of it. What what type of water do you recommend to most of your patients? Well, you know, I am. Um, as long as you know it's it's a complicated issue and it kind of goes out a little too out into the my my own personal approach is that i i am interested in some of these um more esoteric facts about water but for okay. my case generally as long as we're not having a lot of contamination you know imbalance too much copper or too much you know fluoride with uh with um with municipal sources right and uh making sure that the the pH isn't too far in the acidic range. 
Um, but we think about it, hydration as that right. Okay. And then the next step is sleep. We right. die from lack of sleep before we die from you know, from uh, starvation. Yeah, and we're a society that tends not to uh, care much about sleep. Yes, and that's you know that's one fact that we didn't talk about yet today. But that's that's something that I that's part of my intake that I ask patients in detail, and that I feel that if we can maximize healthy sleep, we can get away with a lot of other things. Um, because sleep is that much important for for restoration of the brain and the body, and there's a lot of sleep is a very, uh, and it's, I think it's one of the most mysterious, one of the most interesting phenomena of the human being, really, of, of all living things, and there's a lot of um, there's a lot of approaches to it that I that I practice besides just you know, medications. Melatonin, I uh, prescribe almost universally to older patients. Okay. Because we're all deficient in it from just natural lighting, I mean, from artificial lighting. And I, I've had some practitioners who recommend 0.3 milligrams. And I know other practitioners, especially for certain conditions like cancer, recommend 200, 300 milligrams. Yes, well, the cancer data is very interesting. So yeah, back at Tulane, there was a professor of, uh, uh, there was a lab of, uh, what was it, chrono neuro-oncology, I think they called it. And, and they um, they published some of the work on it, uh, um, on this anti-cancer effect of melatonin, high dose. Very, very impressive data. and. Uh, you know, the, the range varies. My own personal view is whatever works. So there are patients who take one milligram and have intolerable nightmares and there are patients who take, you know, 20 and don't have any effect. Right. Um, quality does vary. Um, but the, the effect of melatonin is, is quite impressive, not only for sleep, but also it's GI effects and antioxidant properties. Right. But sleep, sleep itself is very important. And right. I recommend a lot of things that we're going to. Chinese skull cap is great. Uh, there's a lot of other things that can help with slow wave sleep, even prescription medications if we have to. So I would rather, um, you know, I've, I have prescribed on a short-term basis. I do prescribe sometimes gabapentin um, because it is one of the few medications which actually promotes slow wave sleep. There's very few prescription drugs that do that. So things like antihistamines, Benadryl, I never use. And I don't recommend because they disturb normal sleep architecture. There's actually very few prescription or even over-the-counter pharmaceuticals that promote a natural type of deep sleep. Um, but that's you know a whole another topic. So yeah, um, sleep, eating. It's a whole other topic, you know, I don't have time to get into that, but diet and uh, activity levels. So those are all things that are important. I mean, if you're bed bound, uh, it's not a, that's enough to lead to hospice. So those are the breathing, sleeping, eating and nutrition, and hydration and uh, activity. Those are the four, four you things. Go. That you got to eat right, sleep right, breathe right, and, and poop right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, moving and pooping. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Those are all the four things. If you just fix the basic functions of the body that we have to do, right? Those are going smoothly, efficiently. Then um, that is the definition of health, in my opinion. Yeah, most most things in the body will end up improving and and move towards better health. Yep. Great. So thank you so much for joining us today. How can listeners, uh, 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 viewers get a hold of you, find out more information about you? What's your website? Uh, sure. So it's vaintegrativehealth.com. So VA is in Virginia. And I practice locally in the Richmond area. Um, I have a few YouTube videos on miscellaneous topics, um, a few interviews and a few lectures and grand rounds that I've given in the past. Okay. Do you do telehealth visits? I do. I think legally uh, it has to be 
someone has to be at some point in the state of Virginia. I'm not sure what the rules are, and you know they they've changed a bit since before and after the pandemic. So I would, um, as a rule, I see patients locally. I do see patients by televisit uh, telehealth if they're interested, and I have before. I'm not exactly sure what the rules on that are. I haven't had a lot of out of state, but maybe after talking to you, um, there'll be some interests. I'll have okay. To Sounds good, Doc. Thanks for the conversation. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. It was a pleasure. Thank you for making it all the way through this episode of the Rational Wellness Podcast. For those of you who enjoy listening to the Rational Wellness Podcast, I would certainly appreciate it if you could go to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and give us a five-star ratings and review. That way, more people will discover the Rational Wellness Podcast. And I wanted to let everybody know that I do have some openings for new patients so I can see you for a functional medicine consultation for specific health issues like gut problems, autoimmune diseases, cardiometabolic conditions, or for an executive health screen or and to help you promote longevity and take a deeper dive into some of those factors that can lead to chronic diseases along the way. Um, and that usually means we're gonna do um, some more detailed lab work, stool testing, sometimes urine testing. Um, and we're gonna look at uh, a lot more details to get a, a better picture of your overall health from a preventative functional medicine perspective. So if you're interested, please call my Santa Monica White Sports Chiropractic and Nutrition Office at 310-395-3111 and we can set you up for a new consultation for functional medicine. I'll talk to everybody next week.